so yeah, I'm going to cover hordes that contain objects from more than one period from Britain during the Late Bronze Age and Iron Age, and um, we've already had quite a good introduction to the evidence from uh, Matt and Dot, so it's going to be inevitably some overlap, so apologies That's for that. Fine. But That's means I can skip some bits out. <laughs> So I'll start with a um, quick history and intros to what these are, um, before moving on to show some differences between those dating to the Bronze Age and those to the Iron Age. I'll then highlight some patterns and suggest how and why these groups of objects came to be collected together, and try and interpret and contextualise mixed period hordes and see how they might fit in with other parts of the archaeological record. So hordes containing objects clearly from more than one period have been known for some time, Although, as we've heard already, they're often ignored or dismissed as not being true associations as they cause considerable issues in understanding metalwork chronologies. As early as 1864, a substantial collection of metalwork was brought to A.W. Franks at the British Museum, said to be found together in a field in Hounslow, and it appears that Franks didn't believe the finders and instead recorded them as two separate hordes, one Bronze Age and one another Iron Age. And we've heard about um, Danebury already, so I'll skip that. Um, and the huge Salisbury hoard, I will just quickly dwell on again, as again we've heard um, illegally excavated, dispersed and partially recovered by Ian Stead, and um, definitely well worth a read in um, Stead's book about it, and ended in a um, sting operation and arrest in a pub in Salisbury, which is uh, quite nice. Um, so yeah, although this, this hoard brought um, multi-period hordes to the attention of many, the circumstances surrounding it were still very dodgy. So. Again, as we heard, it took until 2011 or 12, actually, I think that's a mistake, um, when the hoard at Wardle was discovered by metal detectorists and excavated properly. And as we've heard, at Wardle, um, the objects were clearly deposited together mm. and undeniably a single genuine hoard containing objects from the early, middle and late Bronze Age, as well as the earliest Iron Age and early Iron Age. And this discovery has since pro prompted previous suspected mixed period hordes to be re re evaluated. Um, for example, by Matt, our session organiser, uh, has combined the corpus of Bronze Age hordes um, and great debt to Matt for stealing his information for this talk. <laughs> so, what is a multi period horde? Again, we've, we've kind of heard this already. Um, so, I'll skip over it slightly. Um, mixed period hordes are those that contain objects from more than one metalworking phase that are not sequential. So a hoard containing some limfire axes and an earlier Ewart Park sword might not be counted because they could instead be interpreted as a kind of transition hoard. But one with limfire axes and a penard pal stave would count. In fact, it's been useful to distinguish double period hoards from hoards that contain objects from more than two periods. And the latter, I think, can be termed multi-period. I think there's a, quite a clear pattern when we look at mixed period hordes with the latest object dating to the Bronze Age compared with the latest object dating to the Iron Age. Almost all of the Bronze Age mixed period hordes have objects from just two periods, whereas virtually all of the Iron Age hordes have objects from more than two periods, averaging at about five periods. So Bronze Age hordes can be dis distinguished as double period and Iron Age as true multi-period hordes. And we've already seen this one. Uh, this is Shoebury. Um, otherwise, a fairly normal looking late Bronze Age hoard with a single um, earlier object. Um, so the axes and swords are fairly typical of a late Bronze Age hoard from Essex. Although there's this power stave from the Taunton period, um, some 500 years before. And there's also this bracelet, which is slightly unusual, um, but I'll come back to that later. Another example is Stoke Ferry. Again, all the swords and spearheads make up a fairly normal Late Bronze Age horde with the addition of a much earlier halberd. And this is how the majority of mixed period hordes, Bronze Age mixed period hordes, look. For most, they're fairly unexceptional Late Bronze Age hordes with a single earlier object. But when we look at Iron Age examples, a different pattern emerges. Early and middle Iron Age hordes are in general much rarer than Late than Bronze Age hordes. Uh, the whole practice of hoarding almost drops off when bronze stops being the main metal of choice. There are perhaps 11 examples of mixed period hordes with the latest object dating to the Iron Age. All but one contains objects from more than two periods and can be classed as true multi-period hordes. 
and this is what makes them different from the later Bronze Age examples. Uh, they're mostly from central southern Britain, so four in Wiltshire, Hampshire, Berkshire, Surrey and um, London. And this shows the number of periods represented in the 11 Iron Age mixed period hordes, averaging quite nicely at five periods. What's also interesting is that there are examples with the latest objects dating to all of the Iron Age subperiods. We have to kind of assume that the latest object dates the date of deposition, but really it's just the terminus post quem. It does look as though the practice of gathering together these vastly diverse collections of earlier metalwork was something that was happening, at least in central southern Britain, throughout the Iron Age. These are some of the objects from Yattenden, which we've already heard about. And the, the hoard has at least five different periods represented. So an early Bronze Age flat axe, things from two Middle Bronze Age periods, late Bronze Age swords and axes, as well as an early Iron Age axe. And about a thousand years separates the earliest and latest objects with lots of other periods in between. Another example is Crooksbury Hill. Unfortunately, little is known about this, as it uh, wasn't published and it was a, wasn't published well and it was a um, Victorian find. Originally part of a much larger hoard, only five axes, all from different periods, were illustrated in the original report. And a further pal stave is uh, sole survivor. And this is the initial description from 1857. A variety of objects in bronze were found, from the rudest form down to the most elaborately finished weapon, <laughs> including a considerable number of Celts. So it's tantalising and clearly part of a much bigger <laughs> hoard with even more periods pot potentially. Although it's difficult to be certain, I'd like to hear Dot's opinion on this. Um, yes. This is, is that a... Yeah, well... Do we think that's a... I yeah, think catch me later, rights. I think, because if I start talking now, I'll um, steal your ten minutes. So yeah. <laughs> it's, um, I think, yeah, yes, but it's a drawing, so... Yes, it's difficult, yeah. but well, catch, I'm saying it is at the moment. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> I'm happy with that. Good. <laughs> Uh, two big ones are Salisbury and the so-called Bath Eastern Hordes, both from Wiltshire. And again, we've heard, I won't dwell too much on these. Um, over 500 objects from eight periods, perhaps, at Salisbury, including the strange miniature um, cauldrons and shields. And luckily, we have a radiocarbon date from when it was excavated, belonging to the Middle Iron Age. And about 2,200 years separates the earliest and latest objects with virtually every metalworking period in between these represented. And this is really, truly an extraordinary collection. And some of the Bronze Age axes um, on the right, and some of the objects from Bath Eastern on the left. There really is a considerable amount of more information that can be obtained from more in-depth study of these two hordes, and this needs to happen before we can discuss them much further. So the rest of the talk will look instead at trying to contextualise these multi-period hordes with other related things that were happening in the Iron Age, and look at some of the ways that can be interpreted. How did these spectacular assemblages of objects come to be collected together in the Iron Age? Either they were passed down after an extremely long periods of time, the time periods between the oldest and youngest are huge, at least 800 years in all cases and often over 2,000 years, or objects were discovered, collected and traded. We should expect perhaps a degree of both, but I personally think it's more likely that the majority of the earlier objects were discovered in the Iron Age. But there is also some evidence for the retention of objects, perhaps as heirlooms. Trapezoidal razors are quite rare finds in Britain, about two dozen are known, and these date to the earliest Iron Age. Despite their rarity, three were found in the Salisbury Hoard, one each in the Danebury and Wardle Hoards. Also, another very worn example was found in a pit at the back of a house with Middle Iron Age pottery and a dog burial at Slade Farm in Oxfordshire and another again found in a late Iron Age pit at Cabri Castle in Somerset. About a third of the known examples of trapezoid razors are from later contexts. Given the rarity of these, it seems unlikely that so many were found <coughs> later in the Iron Age, but were instead kept and passed down for long periods of time. There are also hints that some objects typically assigned to the Bronze Age were in fact made in the Iron Age. So nail-headed pins date to the late Bronze Age, these are also quite rare, only occasionally found in small numbers on settlements in southern Britain, and I think unlikely, therefore, that many would have been found in the Iron Age. However, at least seven were found in the Salisbury Hoard, one each at the Wardour and Hagborn Hale Hoards, and astonishingly enough, around 50 in the Bath Eastern Hoard. The number from the Iron Age Hoards is in fact more than those not in Iron Age Hoards from all of southern Britain. 
Again, these couldn't have been found in such huge numbers in the Iron Age, and I think it's probably evidence for nail-headed pins being continued to be made well into the Iron Age. Like lots of other types of Iron Age metalwork, these are otherwise entirely absent from the record. Further compositional work is needed to see the extent Bronze Age objects were made in the Iron Age, but I think most seem to be discoveries in the Iron Age. For these such varied accumulations to exist, there must have been a concerted effort to collect together these ancient and weird objects. The objects from each period represented in a hoard would need to be discovered separately, then collected and exchanged to finally amass the assemblages that we have. So each hoard represents at least five, six, seven or more moments of discovery of ancient objects. An agreement that these objects were valued and that effort should be made to collect them together must have been widely shared in the Iron Age. This is the key difference between, I think, Bronze Age and Iron Age mixed period hoards. Bronze Age double period hoards only need one moment of discovery. No concerted effort to collect together the objects together or a wide cultural agreement that ancient objects were important. And apologies, I think those from the Bronze Age are perhaps more incidental than the large Iron Age ones, so sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> we can discuss it later. Yeah. <laughs> So looking at mixed period hordes, I think, between the Bronze Age and Iron Age, you can see a, a difference between how ob ancient objects were treated and the practice being collected together is clearly and valued more Iron Age. And there's evidence that ancient objects, other types of ancient objects were discovered and valued um, that you don't find in hordes, but no time to talk about that. It's possible that valuing ancient objects in the Iron Age shows a value for ancestors and an importance of ancestors in society and world views. While this may be true to some degree, there are other ways of interpreting this interest in unusual ancient objects. If we look at anthropological examples of discovery of ancient material culture, quite a common thing is for these objects to be thought as coming not from ancestors but from supernatural beings. An example is medieval and even modern European explanations for prehistoric flint objects thought to be made by elves or pixies. Think also of prehistoric monuments with Anglo-Saxon names of gods like Wayland Smithy, Wands Dyke or Grimm's Ditch. These things are recognised as being made by human-like beings, but not humans themselves. This might be because they're outside of the cultural repertoire and maybe technical ability of those finding them. Assigning them to actual ancestors might not seem appropriate as they're too different from what's been produced by living communities. Supernatural human-like beings may instead have been more appropriate. Things with supernatural potency can either be feared and something that should be avoided or seen as positively with powers that can be harnessed. For example, the Hebrew of Northwest Amazonia are scared of archaeological remains, thinking that they belong to hostile spirits that will do them harm. But the Luru from Indonesia believe that ancient artefacts have supernatural energy that can be used by the possessor. In this context, owning objects made by gods brings them closer to gods. Others might see them as special, have a divine connection, legitimising an individual with authority or a social position. There's another interesting anthropological observation. Mary Helms argues that for many societies, ancient and foreign things are thought about in very similar ways. Both ancient and foreign are exotic, not made by the culture and context that the actor is familiar with, but, and both are often have supernatural associations. This is interesting because if we go back to the Bronze Age Shubri Hoard, not only do we have the ancient house stave, uh, but also a highly decorated bracelet from the Alps, so a rare import. This is relevant because there are, again, I think quite big differences between how foreign exotic objects appear to have been thought about between the later Bronze Age and Iron Age. Foreign objects were certainly being imported into Britain in the later Bronze Age. We can see this in the composition of metalwork um, and also the rare ship finds, where we have very interesting and certainly exotic objects. So at Salkham ship, uh, shipwreck, there's a sickle from Sicily and at Langdon Bay over 60 French axes. However, in the later Bronze Age, we actually have very few foreign imports outside of the shipwreck assemblages. Many of the objects from shipwrecks are otherwise extremely rare or unknown in Britain. It appears that instead of keeping Exotica and prizing its strange form and origin, these were melted down to create more normal local objects. And we simply don't get the foreign Exotica in the, in the archaeological record. 
neither ancient nor foreign exotica appear to have been as valued perhaps in the later Bronze Age. In the Iron Age, in some areas at least, this is quite different. We have really quite a few truly extraordinary, um, truly exotic imports. And this is a selection uh, from the Thames Valley. This um, <coughs> polished uh, stone shaft hole axe is actually Iron Age and not Neolithic from Lower Saxony, and certainly strange. We have an Etrusc Etruscan cup and a Greek kylix and other Mediterranean objects like brooches found you know, in and around the Thames. We have both a collection of ancient and foreign exotic objects in the Iron Age, and I think they may have been thought about in similar ways. So in conclusion, I feel that mixed period hoards now need to be taken seriously and clear patterns can show their legitimacy. Those from the Bronze Age almost exclusively only have two periods represented, but those from the Iron Age often have really quite mind-boggling collections, including a huge variety of objects from lots of different periods, and are only really found in central southern Britain, or mainly from there. To get these collections, ancient objects must have been discovered and valued, tra traded and gathered together in a way that we simply don't see as much in the later Bronze Age. I think it's likely that supernatural qualities were imparted onto these strange objects. There appears to have been a shift during the transition from the Bronze Age to Iron Age, and how exotic things were thought about. Perhaps they became charged with new supernatural association, or there were differences in the relationship between humans and the supernatural between the Bronze Age and the Iron Age. These might have been seen as the leavings from ancestors, with similar changes to the roles that these ancestral beings had in society. Ancient and foreign exotica were commonly thought in parallel, and I think you can certainly see this in both the Bronze Age and Iron Age. There appears to have been a change in how both were treated and valued. Exactly what the possible, uh, exactly what the role, the possible role ancestral or supernatural things was in the Iron Age is uncertain, but there may have been a social element. People might have been using these to legitimise power or position by harnessing this potency, associating themselves with the supernatural. But exploring this interpretations for another time. I really think the Salisbury Hoard is one of the, really one of the true wonders of British prehistory, and there's certainly much more research that can be done than questions that can be answered. Thank you.